would request our moderator, Surabhi Raja Gopal, Senior Program Manager, Serco Foundation, to join us on stage. In this session, we will discuss the impact and relevance of decentralized healthcare facilities at the last mile. The panel aims to bring together several factors to make a robust system at the local level through public health care, clean energy, and climate resilience nexus. It seeks to strengthen the design of a holistic solution that can strengthen public health facilities and primary healthcare provision via SDG 7 or SDG 13. Requesting our speakers to join us on stage as we welcome them. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome our first speaker, Dr. Kumar G.S., Head of the Health Sector at Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement. A distinguished pediatrician and public health professional, Dr. Kumar has been instrumental in reducing maternal infant mortality among indigenous tribal communities. As head health sector, he oversees the implementation of various health programs, including those under the thematic areas of HIV AIDS, PB care and control, palliative care, and comprehensive care for persons with disabilities. A key member of international collaborations, including the capacity building working group under the HELDI, Dr. Kumar exemplifies a commitment to advancing global health care. Dr. Kumar, welcome. Next, we welcome Mr. Vikram Chaudhary, Secretary, Karuna Trust. Our esteemed speaker, inspired by Swami, Swami Vivekananda, embarked on a journey as a social worker at 22, dedicating their life to serving India's underprivileged. Becoming an ardent public health practitioner, they joined Karuna Trust in 1998, aiming to bring health care to those with no access. Currently serving as secretary since 2019, they oversee 71 government primary health care centers, delivering comprehensive health care to close to a million people. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Vikar Chakuri who continues to lead transformative public health programs. Welcome, sir. Next, we welcome Ms. H. Lalwan Kimi. Ms. Lalwan Kimi is a dedicated public health manager with a wealth of experience in the field. Armed with an MSc nursing, she has spent seven years honing her skills and expertise in the health sector. Currently, serving at the Directorate of Health in Mizoram, managing public health initiatives with focus on addressing urban health challenges, she brings a unique perspective to her role, leveraging her knowledge and experience to develop and execute strategies that positively impact the communities. Welcome, Ms. Nasimhi. Can we please have a round of applause for our panelists? My to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for being here. Uh, and thank you, Thomas and Rachida, for setting the context. Uh, before I go into the panel, I just want to quickly provide a background to the video that you just watched. Um, this, this video is from Meghalaya, and um, it, was, um, it was played during the climate conference that happened in Dubai, uh, COP28, which happened in December um, in, uh, uh, in Dubai. And uh, the reason that, uh, so this was done in partnership with the World Health Organization and IRENA and IKEA Foundation and a whole bunch of other supporters with the idea of bringing the field to a place like a climate conference. Typically what happens in the climate conference is everybody gets bogged down with negotiations, with decisions on, you know, how much, what the targets are, what countries are committing, what they're not committing. Uh, and this attempt was really to say what really matters on the ground and what are the possible solutions to addressing this issue. So we were able to walk delegates through the process of here is the problem statement and there was an immersive film experience. So this film was played inside a dark room 
uh, where they first learned about why uh, health and climate nexus is important. And this was one of the first times a climate conference has paid this much attention to the health issue itself uh, and the linkages between health and climate. And then we were able to talk about the potential solutions that are out there. And I think what was very heartening was that a lot of uh, representatives, especially from countries in sub-Saharan Africa, in the small island states, came out and said, okay, then how can we partner and work on this? Or tell us what we can do to bring this solution into our context. So I think what that reinforced for us is the work that we are doing, uh, that all of you are doing in the northeast of India around building climate resilient health systems is actually very relevant not just for the impacts and outcomes that we see here, but also for uh, re other regions um, with similar contexts in other parts of the world. So I think with that, um, you know, I will uh, quickly say we have a stellar panel here today. And as Rachida mentioned, a lot of the Energy for Health program was really built in partnership with a lot of uh, the stakeholders that we have here. Uh, my name is Surubi. I am a senior program manager with Selco Foundation. I've been with the organization since 2011. Uh, and my background is in environmental policy and regulation. And our work is really, uh, my role sits somewhere around bringing a lot of the approaches and work we've seen on the ground to see how we can amplify it and institutionalize it with government agencies, with domestic philanthropies, uh, and really, um, you know, create that tipping point in terms of taking solutions and programs that are on the ground and taking it to scale. Uh, in this context, I think I'd like to quickly start with uh, Dr. Kumar from SVYM. Uh, we've kind of seen what, you know, uh, an Energy for Health initiative could look like. But perhaps going back a little bit to the roots, uh, what does SVYM itself do as an organization and where does your interest in terms of uh, the health and livelihoods of local communities lie? If you can just start with that. Thank you. Thank you, Sarvi, for uh, inviting us for this uh, panel discussion. It's nice to be here. Uh, it's my second time in the party. It's so nice to be here this time. Uh, 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 as an organization, Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, it's a 40 year old organization. Uh, it all started about 40 years back when uh, a couple of doctors who were Mysore medical uh, students from a medical college in EMI in Mysore. Uh, started working with the tribal communities, particularly looking at the, uh, some of the, as a doctors, some of the uh, health issues, particularly around mother and child uh, health issues. Uh, but the, the founding uh, founders of the you know, organization realized that uh, the, the diseases or the illnesses cannot be treated with uh, medical treatment alone. There is a lot more things, you know, when, when we talk about health beyond uh, medical conditions including health determinants. So one of the uh, key, I mean, couple of key health determinants that were re, you know, realized during that point in time was uh, uh, the importance of water sanitation and hygiene, how that impacts the health and uh, you know, living of the people over there, the education and uh, the, the you know, social and economic status of the people because poverty was as many of you know, is an important cause and the effect of uh, a lot of health conditions. So uh, during this journey, uh, one of the key things that also struck, uh, you know, some of us is when we are interacting with the community that, you know, uh, while, while treating a health condition, it, it, it is not just about that particular person uh, that we should be dealing or a particular illness that we should be dealing with. It's Everything around that person plays an important role, particularly the, the MISO environment, the, the household conditions around that particular person, and the macro environment, you know, both natural and built up environment that becomes very, very important in terms of ensuring, uh, you know, access to healthcare, availability of health services. And our work with the community also, you know, taught us that, you know, unless we kind of uh, respect these things and work in a reciprocal manner, 
uh, the health condition of people cannot be improved. As much as it is important to look at the education livelihood, it is also important for us to work, uh, you know, in in uh, with with the cognizance that environment around that uh, person or a family is very very important. So that is how I mean many of our initiatives. When we started a, one of our uh, initial mobile health units in providing healthcare services, and uh, and you know the mobile health unit acted not just as providing care but also a unit that built the awareness you know try to build the awareness about lot of health conditions but to do that uh, many of the times people would be available large you know uh, in, in the in as a large gathering only in the evening but if you had to go uh, to a remote village in the evening one of the key challenges we had is lack of energy like you know there was no power supply so that we could not have meetings or conduct any kind of drama or uh, you know a street play or something like that so one of our earlier attempts in that is putting the solar energy on top of the mobile health unit which acted as a flood light to conduct uh, this street plays so that was the initial experiment to the you know a lot of recent experiments of how do we uh, uh, ensure the cold chain maintenance uh, uh, you know for delivering the vaccine or you know how do we bring tele uh, uh, medicine services telehealth services to the remote areas so these are some of the experiments that we are kind of right now in one thank you sir uh, if i can just also ask you know the, the the linkage to the context here because a lot of the work that svym does is with the tribal communities around mysore uh, what are those features and factors including the remoteness that might also uh, resonate with the kind of uh, setting we have here uh, in the northeast yeah uh the the communities that we work with uh, are situated in the uh, you know outskirts of a national forest called bandipur and nagarole forest area near mysore it's actually karnataka and kerala and tamil nadu border uh, where many of the works of earlier works of karnataka trust is also there so this area is kind of it's very you know hilly and and uh, you know tribal area and it's a national forest area the the communities used to live inside the forest for uh, many centuries uh, but in late 1970s and 60s the communities were uh, you know uh, shifted from the forest to the periphery of the forest so the terrain or the kind of rainfall or the challenge in terms of you know now things have changed for the last 20 30 years but when we started working in that area the access to road you know to just to, though it was just 60 km from the city of mysore to reach a place called sargur where we are situated it used to take about 3 hours because the roads were literally not existent during that part of time but over the last 30 years a lot of things have changed uh, in terms of penetration of better roads better electricity or you know access to in, in, uh, internet services and all those things that is how the improvement in infrastructure uh, has really helped in uh, uh, closing the gaps that were existing thank you so much uh, i think this feeds straight into uh, ms kimmy's work uh, as a as a public health manager with the national uh, urban health mission but also you've done a lot of work in your nursing profession with the rural health mission as well if you can give us a little bit about the context in mizoram um, and the kind of uh, challenges that come up when you look at energy for health you know a lot of the work that was shown in the film is also revealing uh, what can happen in terms of possibilities in a state like meghalaya and i know the context in terms of hilly terrain so if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, your context thank you so much ms uh, subadi for inviting me to attend this wonderful session so i think we have seen in the videos it's uh, same challenges happens uh, with meghalaya so as uh, mizoram we are staying in a hilly area uh, because of mountainous terrain mizoram's hilly landscape creates more problem then uh, significant uh, logistically ch uh, challenges in uh, hard to reach area in rural communities so it can lead to Uh, high infant mortality rate and high maternal mortality rate because difficult to access healthcare facilities for those who are staying in remote areas. 
then uh, rainfall heavy because of heavy rainfall and landslide during monsoon season it brings intense rainfall then it can uh, it leads to landslide because of it we cannot uh, we cannot travel to another facilities so when the patient needs to refer for uh, urgent management uh, for saving uh, saving their lives so due to landslides and due to heavy rainfall the patient ha uh, cannot reach the the other facility on time. So due to that reason also it goes up that our infant mortality rate and maternal mortality rate. But when we look back a 15 years, uh, 15 years at the time, so in Mizoram especially before our IMR uh, was uh, 32, after that it declines 27, then after that it declines 15, then 5, now our IMR rate is 3. So we really need to, to get the power supply, uh, power supply for maintenance of the uh, maintenance of the emergency purpose. Suppose when we need to give uh, emergency care to the patient, like uh, oxygen with the help of concentrator, then when we need to con uh, perform procedure like uh, procedure like testing of hemoglobin level then electrocardiogram but when there is no regular power supply so we won't be able to conduct the test so we cannot see if the lies that means then uh, thank you then inaccessible roads because uh, due to that reason also we uh, more, more, we cannot see uh, sometimes it happens uh, we cannot save the lives then uh, now our opioid the food follow so it's uh, quite low because of inaccessible inaccessible roads due to especially in rural areas our many of the roads are very bad then many of the roads are poorly maintained so due to that reasons also we cut uh, most of the people cannot reach the facility then lack of electricity power is also during monsoon season when the rain comes power will cut off. Then when the trees fall and the power will cut off. So within a day it will cut off more than 10-15 minutes. So we cannot be able to maintain those sensitive vaccines and immunizations. So when the snake, uh, snake bite comes, when the dog bite comes to our facility, we cannot provide those, uh, those type of vaccines to the patients. So again they have to travel to another facility like district hospitals or another, another sub-district hospitals. So they have to spend more money for transportation. Then some people they don't have money to go there and again it will be a big problem for the patients also. Thank you. I think uh, you've thrown light on a lot of the issues that we saw in terms of uh, both geographic challenges as well as what it means. <laughs> For last my patients yes, accessing health. Yes. If we have seen in the in the videos that they conducted delivery in the video, no, it happens in the, the same thing in Mizora. So when they come to our facility because of uh, lighting issues, because of uh, these power issues, sometimes uh, uh, we conducted delivery under the emergency light. So it's not the same for the patient and for the healthcare professionals also. We cannot control. Uh, these infections, we cannot do, uh, we can't uh, perform this procedure like stitching, then management of minor injury, injection, all those small procedures are also very difficult to manage with the help of, uh, uh, with, with using only this emergency light. That's also it's a big challenge for us. Thank you. Uh, we'll circle back on you know what the Energy for Health program has meant in Mizoram. But if I can request uh, Mr. Venkar to uh, you know Karuna Trust was actually one of the main organizations for us to learn about the fact that when you start to look at energy for health, we really have to start with what are the health services that are being provided, rather than okay there are three lights and a fan now we will power this and walk away. Um, but it was through that partnership that we learned a lot about uh, the kind of services that were required at each health facility level. And this has been built a lot on the public-private partnership model that Karna Trust runs. If you can give us a little bit about the breadth and the scale of the work, especially in the Northeast, and what it has meant uh, to work with these multiple stakeholders. Thank you. Uh 
thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, and also as always happy if you come to a Selco event it's like our extended family as uh, Surabhi was mentioning so we always work together especially in uh, energy and health nexus and uh, uh, it's a great uh, uh, topic to be you know part of it now um, I just to give you the background of Corona Trust. Corona Trust has emerged as a response to high prevalence of leprosy in a remote village in uh, Yalandur Taluk, that is foothills of Bihar Hills. Bihar Hills is, uh, if you know, the, the infamous brigand uh, Virapans area. So there was very high prevalence uh, of leprosy. Dr. Sudarshan, who is the founder of Karuna Trust, as a medical doctor, he used to conduct uh, leprosy clinics you know, to eradicate leprosy. And then uh, other communicable diseases like uh, tuberculosis and malaria and other clinics he used to conduct. Then he thought that this is uh, why I am doing this work. This is supposed to be done by the government and the government primary health centers. And the primary health centers are not performing well or they are not able to function well. Uh, that's the reason this uh, we, we are to uh, do this work. Then he had a thought that why don't we partner with the government instead of doing you know, separate work because you have to raise money, you have to recruit people, you have to do work. Why don't we use the government system and uh, do the same work? So. Then he happened to meet uh, Secretary Health, the Government of Karnataka and said, uh, why don't you give one of your health centre to me, I will run it for you because you are not able to run. Then Secretary, by the time Dr. Sudarshan was very popular social worker, he got Padma Shri Award, he got Right Livelihood Award, which is supposed to be the, the alternative Nobel Prize, so his words are well taken. So when he says, why don't you give me one of your health centre to me, I will run it for you. Then the health secretary said, oh, it, is, uh, it has never happened before. And uh, because it's a government system, we can't give it to a private people. Then he um, then said, how to, how to make the health system more stronger? I want to be partnered with you. Then he said, if you can bring some money, then I can convince the government. Then um, he said, how much money you want? He said, at least if you can bring 25% of the budget for the primary health center. Then we can, I can convince the government. Then he said, fine, I can, anyway I'm raising 100% now, so I can bring in 25%. In fact, I, my burden will come down. So, in 1996, we have signed an agreement with the government of Karnataka, uh, taking two primary health centers under public-private partnership, uh, contributing 25% of the budget of that primary health center with the complete management in our hands. Today, that primary health center, which we have started in 1996, is NABHL accredited primary health center. This is the only primary health center presently have NABHL accreditation. You can, you can see, you can think. That just yesterday when I was driving in the streets of uh, Gauhati, I have seen a board, uh, the only NABH hospital in the uh, first NABH NABH hospital in the NE region. I have seen one board here. So I can say proudly we could be able to bring NABH quality accreditation at primary care level, which was never even NABH has not even thought about it. They never thought that quality can be brought to the PHC, primary health center level. We challenged them. We said, Quality is also to be brought to the primary care. So, uh, we started our journey like that and the public-private public partnership has become a, uh, it's a, it was well taken, especially by government of Karnataka and uh, they have formed a policy called Arogya Bandhu policy. Under that, the poor performing primary health center can be given for public-private partnership. And uh, this can be medical colleges, this can be NGOs with uh, health background. And uh, so 
Then we got invitation from government of Orissa and government of Arunachal Pradesh, government of Meghalaya, and then so we have partnered with them for almost last 20 years. And uh, for last 27 years with the government of Karnataka, uninterrupted partnership. In fact, uh, a lot of people ask us, how is that you could able to partner with governments for so long? It is so difficult to partner with uh, governments. But uh, we could be able to uh, sustain this partnership. So it's a wonderful journey. And uh, we could be able to do a lot of things during this partnership. In fact, uh, today I was talking to somebody in the breakfast table that working with the government system is the only solution, especially in the health sector. We cannot do anything impactful work without partnership with the government. So luckily we could be able to realize that much before 27 years back and we are sustaining that partnership and we are going stronger. And then uh, we, uh, when actually our partnership with uh, Selco came into the picture, uh, in fact, uh, as most of you know, the primary health care is in the in the midst of so many issues, so many issues, not one, everything is a problem. Uh, starting from uh, resources, financial resources, very poor allocation of money. In fact, uh, uh, we always tell, we give comprehensive primary health care for 200 rupees per person per annum. This is a, the worst, low, world's lowest spending comprehensive primary health care for 200 rupees per person per annum. That includes communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and uh, immunization, and mother and child care. And with such low resources, you can imagine the kind of problems that we have. Then Selco came and said, what about energy? We never thought that energy is such an issue. Because we are already in the midst of so many problems. Then when we look at it, it is the problem. It is the real problem. And uh, we could, we could, uh, in fact, Selco opened our eyes. Because earlier, having hot water facility to our lab room is the greatest luxury. One solar panel, 25, 24 by 7, hot water availability is the luxury. From such a state, we could be able to think of 24 by 7 power to entire health center and then to the entire uh, the quarters, all the, the staff who work in the health center and then equipments work with alternative energy. Not only that, Efficient equipment, because we never thought about the efficiency part at all. Because most of our medical equipments are inefficient, energy inefficient. Uh, like for example, I tell you, the classic example is autoclave. The kind of energy sucks, it is mind-boggling. And then uh, you were, uh, then much beyond that, which was never thought, uh, Namita is here, that we thought of designing a building for the health center. Energy efficient building for the uh, primary health care and the sub-centers. It is never thought about. And we did all that. Then we understood the importance of it. Because the, it is, in especially states like Karnataka, uh, energy was not a very big issue. It is available, but is it, can we, dependability was the issue. Energy was available. It's not that we don't have, of course, we have the connection. We have main grid connection is there. But in the, in the midst of the night, an emergency delivery happens. Do, uh, can I depend on the main grid? That is the question. And that was always, it was undependable. And that is where we got this uh, uh, energy, uh, solar energy, and, uh, and not only there, including urban areas. And you can, you can't even imagine a city like Bangalore fails. 
during the you know, an emergency condition. So we thought we cannot take risks, we cannot take you know, chances with the energy. And then we could be able to you know, put the energy to all our urban health centers also and rural. Then we came to other states, Orissa, Arunachal, Meghalaya. And, uh, and also we have innovated uh, energy efficient equipment, especially uh, baby care equipment. And we, in fact, uh, if you know, we have uh, in Labadun, you have one something called suction, something called uh, baby warmer, and uh, all these are one, 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 one piece. And each, each takes a different kind of energy requirement. Can we, can't we have everything in one in, with the help of Senko? We have designed uh, in a way to uh, integrate a baby care unit. So what I'm saying is there is so much to do and uh, luckily we have started that as uh, Sorabi was mentioning. This has a huge potential to not only for India, for the other countries. Thank you. Thank you so much sir and for bringing in the energy efficient equipment piece especially. Uh, I'll turn it back to Dr. Kumar because we've been working uh, in Mysore with the tribal communities looking at last mile health facilities and how to equip them, solar power them but also bring in innovations within that um, in the absence of uh, extremely qualified medical professional at the last mile. So if you can give us some examples of what has been working on the ground there. Um. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, you know with partnership with Sanko as well that we uh, did. I know uh, when we are working with the community there, we realize that the kind of plight of people who are actually uh, had to travel unnecessarily, even for the smallest health issue, and this became a very very important issue and it became a very you know the, came into limelight during COVID. When most of the hospitals were either treating or seeing only patients with COVID, or there is a lot of fear among the community that you know, if I go to a hospital, then I might catch COVID. So what do I do? I cannot sit at home and do nothing about the you know illnesses that or the health related suffering that I have. But now I can you know confidently go to a hospital and say that I can go and get the treatment. So one of the, uh, you know, some experiments during that point in time we did was provide tele, uh, you know, consultation services through a community radio, just to kind of give uh, assurance to the people, say that whether, you know, the disease condition or the health condition that you have, whether it requires a visit to the hospital or can you be at home and can wait uh, until, uh, you know, the, you know, some time till your symptoms is resolved or uh, do you need to visit a hospital immediately. So that kind of help has changed, uh, help has changing our perspective that not all diseases or not all health conditions require visit a hospital immediately. But at the same time, we were also concerned if there is a serious health condition, then there is a chance that people, uh, you know, may not uh, uh, visit the hospital and it can become a severe illness. And even during COVID, uh, many of our visits to the tribal areas through a mobile health unit was interrupted because people were not allowing an entry of a mobile health unit, which is considered as a foreign uh, thing. Like, you, know, you might bring, the, you are coming from a hospital, you might bring the infection here, we don't want you to come to the, uh, you know, our tribal hamlets. So these kind of, uh, uh, you know, challenges that came during COVID also became an opportunity to think differently on how do we ensure in a balance between uh, providing access to services, making it available. At the same time, not just kind of making, you know, creating a, you know, in a huge infrastructure to provide this kind of basic services. So uh, that is where we started engaging with the community, having conversation. And thankfully, we also noticed that the uptake of a lot of internet services was at its peak during COVID. A lot of people started adapting to the use of internet and, you know, uh, you know, telecalling all the facilities. So we seized that opportunity and uh, started, you know, de deployed two telemedicine units in two areas. We first started as a pilot in one area in consultation with Panchayat, a room next to a Panchayat office, local, uh, you know, uh, Panchayat uh, uh, office.
office uh, and, and you know, installed a telemedicine clinic. And so that people need not have to come to an hospital uh, you know, uh, for even for minor illnesses or getting, getting their blood sugar checked or getting their BP tested or if they have uh, some illnesses, they can uh, reach out to a doctor and you know, based on the advice of the doctor, they can take the uh, next step. So same way, uh, we wanted to test a similar situation in a remote tribal area. Uh, which has no, uh, uh, you know, uh, health facility in the uh, in the, the surrounding. So this uh, unit actually came up as a discussion with Selco as a, a comprehensive unit where we also looked at, you know, because it has to be built in a, you know, in, in a, uh, the, the, the panchayat provided only the land. It didn't have any electricity connection. It didn't have any water connection and anything like that. So we had to set up a static uh, telemedicine unit. So when we discussed with Selco, uh, they came up with the design of creating a, a you know energy efficient uh, telemedicine kiosk uh, in in uh, remote tribal area. So today, uh, what the, I mean, the, we started this experiment in uh, last uh, July. So so far, more than 690. Uh, sorry, 594 patients have access care in both these centers, and uh, uh, more than uh, uh, you know 38 patients who required referral. So you could see that, like out of those 600 patients, only 38 required actual referral to a hospital. So it that is the kind of proportion. So 38 out of 38, 24 actually reach the hospital. You know, uh, so that is the kind of impact of telemedicine. That is, you know, reducing the unnecessary travel to a hospital uh, and, and saving a lot of things. So, and the, another interesting thing is, you know, this facility we said, you know, in consultation with community will not be free of cost. And community contributed close to 24,000 for taking the services of the telemedicine unit. So there is an accept rate. It's not just you know free service that people want. People want a service and they are willing to contribute for maintaining that. We said like to run and operate. You might have given the land free, but mm. you know many other uh, costs that are there. Can we partner with them? So that is how the uh, two uh, telemedicine units are uh, functioning. But on average, there will be four or five patients visiting. We are not looking at efficiency in terms of number of people visiting at this point because it's a, it's a small geographic area. But for people, there's a lot of saving that is happening through this. Uh, and that really, yeah, bringing the solution or, or changing the mode by which that innovation is accessible to people and therefore reducing, I think it's a significant number in terms of reducing the actual um, footfall that's going to the next level of the health facility or having been referred to the higher level of health facility. Um, uh, Ms. Kimi, I think this is, uh, you know, in terms of remoteness and the impact of decentralized solar energy solutions, when you look at things like maternal care and immunization in a context like Mizora, if you can tell us a little bit about the kind of benefits that have been seen. So with Mizoram, uh, the Energy for Health program has kicked off and we now have about 400 uh, uh, primary health care facilities that are being solar powered or that have been solar powered uh, with the goal of blanketing the entire state of Mizoram. So what are the kind of impacts that we're seeing right now, especially in terms of last mile care, both in terms of the benefits for end users and in terms of the benefits for staff? Yeah, thank you. So this. Uh, the Selco Foundation focus on the decentralized of solar energy that directly tackles, uh, directly provided to the all the health centers, those who are in remote areas especially. Then now we can see that uh, proper routine immunization could be conducted with the help of uh, this solar backup. Then uh, our Photo, photo, no, baby warmer. Also, we can we can use whenever we want. So then, uh, due to that reason, also we can save so many lives, like newborn baby, newborn baby. Then, uh, uh, one more thing. So now, Silco Foundation focus uh, to install 
over 410 sub-centers and primary health centers. Now, uh, they have completed almost 326 facilities. Then the remaining 84 sub-centers and primary health centers will be uh, installed within this year. They are planning to finish by this year. Then at the health and, uh, at the, at the health and wellness centers, this refrigerator is a mandatory. As I already said that, when the patient comes with low bites and snake bites or whatever it is, so when the patient comes with minor injury, we give some sensitive vaccines or some sensitive medicines. Like So because of that reason also, we need refrigerator at the facility. That is mandatory. It is very, very important. Uh, due to that reasons also this solar backup is very helpful so especially in rural areas now we can uh, we can maintain all those sensitive medicines then uh, lightings as I, we already said and with the help of proper lightings and regular lightings we can manage safely and we can manage uh, we can perform a safety procedure for the patients then medical equipment so this is very important so when we when uh, the, when we need to conduct emergency laboratory tests for all the patients, so we can conduct whenever we want without backup of the solar <coughs> energy or whatever backup backup. So medical equipments, if we have a good medical equipment at the facilities also, but without power, we cannot perform any procedure and saving the lives. Then uh, resilient infrastructure like uh, suppose. When we wanted to conduct this uh, audit services, also we need to carry, uh, carry all those routine immunizations. Then, then some medicines we need to carry with uh, this call box, yeah, vaccine and carrier, yeah, with the help of call box. So without that power backup, uh, we without having this uh, regular power supply, we cannot carry and we cannot reach to the remote areas. That's the thing. But now, I think uh, last year, uh, solar installation have been launched in the last year, September, if I'm not mistaken. So th that time also we have received so many devices like Peter Doppler, hemoglobin meter, so many devices we have received from the Selco Foundation. That also we are using for home visit purposes, then home-based newborn care, then for palliative care, we are providing care. So whatever we want, we can test on their doorstep. So because of that, also very useful. So when there is no regular power supply also, we can go back to our facility, then we can charge from our facility. Then we can bring it back to the, to the uh, patient. So because of that, also very useful. Then kept this, uh, I'll just include this capacity building and community empowerment. This Elko Foundation also often trained to the local people for operation and maintenance of the solar system, then fostering to ownership, fostering of ownership, and then they involve in this maintaining and operation of our solar system. So that it, it is also very, uh, very wonderful for us. Then uh, one more thing: the, the energy for uh, the energy of health program, a collaborative efforts between the. Uh, Government of Mizoram and Selco Foundation aims to sustain power to all the uh, sustainable power to all the facilities. Then so that is very crucial for saving our uh, saving lives and uh, giving a uh, quality services. Last year, uh, Chief Secretary Conference was held in New Delhi. That time also they have uh, commit uh, they have commit they have made some commitments for all the facilities all over India. So all the facilities uh, should be certified as a national quality assurance standard. Because of that also we really need this power backup like uh, solar insulation or whatever it is. Because at all the facilities we need to install air condition or refrigerator everywhere. Why? Because some medicines uh, could not be stored at a normal temperature, like some medicines we have to maintain around 20, uh, 25 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius. Because of that, we need to maintain our temp room temperature at the labor room and pharmacy. Because of that reason, also we need all this uh, solar insulation in Mizoram. All over India also, we can say that. So, yeah. Thank okay. you. I think yesterday we were mentioning how 
just even entering administrative information right to update records has been such an important uh, ad addition through this uh, through solarization before i hand it over to the audience sir if everything is so great and wonderful and if it is all so helpful why are there challenges in in looking at scale and institutionalizing these things within the IPHS guidelines or within uh, larger programs. The National Program of Climate Change and Human Health does talk about solarization. There is attempts at budgetary allocation, but what are the challenges uh, for government level institutionalization of uh, energy for health? So, <coughs> as I told you, that uh, health system, and if you want to talk to Health system is, uh, is concentrating on many things and energy was a low priority. So, but luckily with all the work together and it got the attention of the governments now and uh, they are talking about it and uh, only one big problem which I see in this uh, scaling up and uh, continue to have uh, solar energy in our health uh, centers is two things. One is maintenance. The because the installation is okay, it is a capital cost, and uh, we can centralize, we can install. The maintenance part of it, two things we need to take care. One is the technical uh, skill to maintain this equipment, especially the battery and the panels. Second thing is about the money. Because these uh, have a life, for example, a battery have a life of three years, five years. The later you need to replace. Uh, that involves cost. And if you don't have the money, then uh, the whole system will uh, collapse. So how do you handle that? So at uh, Corona Trust, uh, we had an innovation. What we did was, uh, we, of course, while installation itself, uh, we have a long-term annual maintenance contract. Uh, long-term means three years. But after three years, what? Now we already completed three years. After three years, what? So that what we did was uh, we have uh, this uh, National Health Mission gives untied fund. Untied fund of 1,75,000 per year. So we said, uh, why don't we use that? So we told uh, our... Uh, Janarugya Samajis or uh, ARS or Raksha Samiti or Rogi Kalyan Samajis that uh, no, now you have to maintain, this is yours and uh, this equipment is yours, this battery is yours, everything is yours, you have to maintain. Not, not only maintain, you may have to extend or expand to further level. So luckily our uh, Janarugya Samajis and uh, RKS, they have understood the importance of it and they have signed the contract to you know, an annual maintenance contract with the suppliers. So that solved a great problem. Then another important angle which we need to look at it, like for example now Selco is talking about 25,000 health centers uh, powering with solar, but can't, can't the health system itself, can't they do it? Don't they have the money? Do, they do have money. And especially this money, like 1,75,000, is it's quite a big money. And if you can design a modular expansion, like for example, not necessarily the entire health center should have a solar energy. Can't we have, initially can't we have only labor room, high priority. Labor room is high priority. Can't we have only, uh, what you call, ILR. Now, to store the vaccine or only refrigeration or lighting comes the last and uh, so what happens is as and when you have the money you can have a modular expansion then in fact you don't need any external agency because we are already spending uh, minded we are already spending money on other sources like for example like uh, earlier we are spending on diesel for generator in fact, we were also buying generator. So, if it's, it's only bringing that thinking into the system that you now we need to, uh, instead of spending money on, on uh, uh, high cost diesel or high cost generator, which is, which is not renewable, 
why don't we spend on the clean energy like solar and also it is low maintenance and low recurring cost. So that is how we have to bring the thought into the system and uh, I think with that uh, by maybe a sort of a guidelines coming from the government of uh, India through national health mission and to the states, I think institutionalization is possible and we could be able to show already. It's not that we have not, uh, because this is now it's already institutionalized. Only thing is we need to drill that thought into the system uh, at different levels, at the policy level, at the implementation level, at the lower level. But another important aspect which, we, which I always see the problem is the skill. Skill at, the, at that level. Can we, can, we, can we have certain, some unemployed youth you now train them to maintain these equipments and so they will get employment and then uh, you know, so that the equipments are made. Today we are finding it's very difficult. In fact, some of my colleagues are here. They constantly ask, you know, this is gone, this is gone, where to go? Especially in the East. Now we always come to the Brigad, we always come to Bhavati. Is it not possible, especially in remote uh, China border? We, we run a primary health center in Vijayanagar. You can imagine that we have to only fly through, uh, we only have to go to place by helicopter and uh, this kind of places. So you cannot, uh, uh, maintenance is a big thing. So we need to have that skill available at the local level. Then adoption will become so complete. And and to, to, uh, there is one more angle to this, that uh, solar energy only in the health center may not be highly sustainable. Can others also adopt that same technology, same thing? Then it will become, the, the, it will become, it will become mainstream energy. Like for example, maybe a rice mill, maybe a flour mill, maybe a uh, community health center, sorry, community center, or uh, maybe some houses or the staff quarters of the health center where they can buy back, they, they can pay, they can pay so that you can have a centralized, um, uh, what you call, energy available and the, the scale will increase at that level. So, what happens, institutionalization will become easy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think we will be discussing those aspects of the operations and maintenance models as well as the training of um, training and skilling requirements to be able to take this forward and what that could mean when we talk about procurement or institutionalization of some of these guidelines. Um, I'll just throw the floor open to the audience for any questions uh, to the panelists that we have here. If you could just introduce yourself as well, when you. My name is Dr. Kiran. I am representing the state of Manipur. I am a district nodal officer of one of the district uh, for a national program on climate change and human health. So uh, my question is that uh, solarization, there is a one contract for the maintenance. As Sir has also rightly said, like uh, maintenance is for three years for a uh, uh, Karbana Trust or something. And they, for uh, Manipur is five years. So it's like after five years, the issues that we are going to face. So if there is something like without uh, uh, giving away to the individual health facility, the responsibilities for the maintenance, because as I say, like 1.5 lakh is uh, per year, and moreover, it is not given timely also. And moreover, we have uh, to do a lot of the other activities other than the solar. So it's like if that you can go for some kind of the public-private partnership with the government uh, for the long-term maintenance. Because if you leave it to the health facility alone, then I think it won't be a successful program in the long run. So any suggestion on that? Which we are forgetting, actually, the like a savings. Like for example, if you are using the solar, and that to that extent you are power bill will come down. And uh, let's say your power bill is 500 rupees per month and after your solar uh, 
altercation of the center, it is coming only 200 rupees. Now that 300 into 12, that is 3600 rupees. So that money, if you can put it separately, and in fact that will also be used for your maintenance. And some money can come from, definitely I agree that uh, no, your, uh, the NHF money doesn't come in a very uh, regular fashion. But at least you can tie up with the maintenance people, you can sign a contract after five years or after three years saying that we will pay you because anyway they have a dependence, the government will always will pay. And uh, you sometimes you have to be a little innovative at that level. You have to see that, no, uh, because see, if, if that is the case, none of the funding comes uh, in place, in, in time. So sometimes even salaries comes late, but there is an assurance that it comes. So if you can assure your supplier or your maintenance uh, contractor that, you know, we will pay you. And a little bit of uh, this kind of innovative, like, you know, my power bill has come down, the power allocation, because already you, you are paying before and you are saving that money. You, instead of uh, uh, let go, uh, you, you should keep that money separately. So with a little bit of innovation, I think you can solve the problem. Thank you. Um, I think we'll take that last question and then I'll request closing comments from the speakers. Uh, we can um, continue the discussion over. Please. I'm Dr. Meena Seramsky, an old officer, Matanen and Manipur. I'd like to supplement a little bit on what Dr. Kiran has mentioned. Actually, there is one uh, letter from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Uh, I think it's on 22nd April 2023. It was issued and I think uh, it is mentioned here that 10% uh, of the funding can be proposed in the PIP. So I think it, since the Ministry have already issued one uh, you know, memo. So I think we can, either in the states or the northeastern uh, states here, we can propose in the PIB. This will be very helpful because if the RKS fund uh, if, or the JAS fund, if it comes to us also, it is never enough. It is not regular and thus it is not uh, enough. But if we uh, propose separately this 10 person, uh, you know, for the solarization, I think it will be very, very helpful. helpful. And uh, yeah, this is one. This is one thing I want to uh, say. But apart from this, uh, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, on behalf of the, you know, uh, my health department of the state of Manipur, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Selco Foundation for the immense, you know, help they have given to the public health facilities in the state of Manipur, and especially the the hill districts and the remote areas, the facility out there, I've seen myself. So they have already provided, uh, you know, there are 167 uh, public health facilities which are solar, uh, you know, uh, powered, solar powered. And uh, apart from this, there are some equipments also they have given, the labor, labor table, the suction machines, uh, the delivery kits, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, many other microscope, many other equipments they have given. So this have, uh, you know, when we go for monitoring visits and all, and when we see the data also, there are lots of improvement. We have already seen the beautiful uh, video clip from the Galia, and the eminent speaker have already highlighted the impacts. Yes, there is, you know, uh, you know the uninterrupted uh, supply, uh, you know, uninterrupted supply of the, uh, you know, uh, energy have provided us, you know, 24 by 7 services. You know, it has, uh, you know, uh, improved and, uh, uh, apart from that, we have this, uh, you know, they have also enhanced uh, the, 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 you know, uh, the activities of the, you know, facilities, uh, the, the well-being of the staff also it has increased. And we've seen in certain places where there is no light at all, you know, the, the, the staff quarters are also not good. And on top of that, if there is no light, you can just imagine how the conditions are. And Manipur being the state, uh, highest out-of-pocket expenditure in the whole country. I think uh, uh, the Selco Foundation have, uh, you know, brought about a change and in near future, it will increase the out-of-pocket expenditure uh, for deliveries or other treatments. And, uh, you know, uh, especially because of the equipments they have provided, the maternal health uh, programs have improved a lot. Yes, we have national health programs. In addition to that, because of the Selco Foundation, our institutional delivery 
In the last two, three years, it increased from 80% to 87% in the, uh, in the third quarter report, a uh, challenges report. And uh, yes, uh, uh, in the long run, of course, uh, since uh, solar is uh, clean, energy eco friendly, uh, the beautiful states of not only Manipur but all the northeast. They will preserve, uh, you know, the, the natural beauty as well as, you know, it will help in reducing the climate uh, change or the global warming. And uh, I, I, there, in the near future, uh, we are we are having a partnership with uh, with Selco Foundation and the uh, the Sea Camp. There is uh, the the maternal fetal, uh, you know, monitor. Uh, we are going to install in the 46 uh, facilities which are solar powered by. Uh, Selco Foundation, and soon if it is uh, roll out, I think uh, maternal mortality uh, ratio will surely reduce. In infant mortality rate, though, though it is six at present, further it will help in reducing it. And uh, finally, I, I will urge, I would like to urge the Selco Foundation to continue their goodwill and to extend help in other remaining health facilities uh, which are yet to be solar powered. And uh, this is a very very uh, helpful, uh, you know, uh, to all the, I think not only Manipur, but all the northeast, uh, northeast states. And uh, recently, uh, I, I, I don't know whether you have time, but I want to enact something. I have been to all the border areas of Manipur, all the hilly terrains, very difficult ones. Since 2016, I was planning to go to one center called Toksim, which is in the Tamilong district, which is a high priority district. And uh, you know, recently in, in uh, 2023 February, I am able to go there because the chief medical officer keeps telling, "Madam, it's raining. You can't come." And when I went there, I realized it's a three day three days trip. I realized how difficult the the, the situation is. Every year, maternal deaths happen. So I want to see that uh, PAC how it is running. So I'm very happy to see that Selco Foundation have reached before me. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, they were very, very happy. And uh, you know, it has increased the uh, effectiveness and efficiency of the staff. Very few in numbers, though. But uh, you know, uh, with the proper lighting, uh, they're very happy to work. You know, when you work in darkness, how it is you can see in the picture it is happening in the candlelight. You're teaching, or you are the epidermal suture. Uh, you are doing suturing. So you know the. Uh, we are the bricks. Being a woman, I'm so much concerned about the, you know, the, the ladies who are pregnant out there, all those who are coming for treatment. How we are, you know, uh, you know, how, how many of us are at bricks? So, uh, lastly, I'm, again, I'm very thankful to Sekko Foundation and the whole team who is here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments, ma'am. If anything, we are thankful to you for championing the effort on the ground uh, and also I think more than Selco Foundation it was actually the local clean energy enterprise that reached before you did. Uh, those are the partners that we're working with on the ground. We will touch a little bit more upon the uh, funding mechanisms and the leveraging of resources both in the state sessions that we have this afternoon as well as in uh, tomorrow's session. And it would be great to discuss what are the kind of local funding sources that are available and the mechanisms by which we can unlock them, whether it's for maintenance, whether it's for capital expenditure. But uh, thank you to, for, for sharing your comments and your thoughts and uh, for championing the effort on the ground. Uh, any last comments from uh, Dr. Kumar and uh, Ms. Kimi? Uh, so I, 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 you know, there's a lot of great work is happening, and whenever such things are happening in this scale, there is always scope for innovation. I believe, but it is not just about reaching the numbers, reaching the targets, but it's creating impact. You know, causing the out, you know, resulting in the outcome. So I think that I'm hoping that there will be a lot of such uh, experiments, innovation that will come out uh, as a model from uh, Northeast experience. So that will probably get the rest of the country as well. That's what I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, see, one more uh, aspect we need to look at is uh, not only the primary care and uh, the community health center, we also have to look at the critical care. So critical care, 
uh, health, uh, including uh, the energy part, which is actually missing. In fact, uh, Corona Trust, along with uh, Ego Foundation, uh, we have established uh, 10 bed ICUs in uh, almost all the states of Northeast and uh, every district. And uh, the 10 ICU beds, and it, they need the critical power. And in fact, uh, I can tell from Manipur, one of our experience, where a critical patient came and uh, the patient required uh, intubation and uh, that there were no medical doctor in the district hospital. And our hub from IMFAL, uh, tele-ICU hub from IMFAL, decided to request the nurse to do the intubation. And uh, the, the experts from IMFAL could be able to guide the nurse to do the intubation and uh, it is a risk, a risk to uh, either you do it a risk, if you don't do it a risk. So they took, uh, uh, they took a decision to try uh, guide the nurse and the, the nurse did the intubation and the patient survived. So this is a, a critical area where again energy is a component, we should look at it if you can uh, also include the uh, energy at the critical care units also is important angle. Then another important thing is ecosystem. The ecosystem of uh, the, the, I'm talking about the energy ecosystem in the, in the village. Not only, not only the primary health care, or sorry, not only health system, but the, the if you can uh, develop the ecosystem, maybe to the schools, Maybe to the Anganwadis, maybe to the village institutions like Panchayat, and then small enterprises like I'm talking about the flour mill, rice mill, and all that. Then ecosystem will develop. Then it becomes self-sustained model. So there is no much need for the uh, like uh, thinking about maintenance and all that. So with that, I think uh, the what I am saying is your. Uh, Solar energy should become mainstream energy. That's, uh, that should be our goal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any, any closing remarks and how the best practices can be taken forward? I'll just have one minute. My experience in rural area, I have visited one PHC for uh, assessment for uh, under the CPHC. So when I visited the PAC, I was there at night time, it's around 7 o'clock. That time the doctor was calling everyone to go to the facility because of emergency cases. They have received uh, one uh, pregnant mother uh, who is uh, staying away uh, almost 60 kilometers from the PAC. They travel with the, with the by bus, they travel with by bus when they when they reached the hospital, she was uh, unconscious. She's not a, she's a, she's not a conscious. Then uh, it uh, it was uh, she she was having a heavy bleeding, heavy bleeding. Then the baby was already died. Then nothing nothing could be done at the PHC level. But when we refer the patient, so it will take uh, almost four hours to reach the another district hospitals. So we try to manage uh, with the help of uh, whatever available resources at the facility. So that time when we test the patient hemoglobin level, it was only three. But there was no blood storage unit because of irregular power supply. There's so many reasons. So we uh, then we just put a, a whiteboard cannula uh, for two. Then we just give uh, infus IV infusion, whatever it is available at the facility. Then the next day, that, that, that time, if there is a, a regular power supply or if there is any other medical equipment to transfuse the patient, uh, to transfuse the patient blood, so that easily we can manage the patient's uh, lives. So due to that reason, also we really need this power backup at all the facilities, in, especially in hard to reach area. That time also I was I felt so bad because due to that reason because of lack of medical equipment lack of uh, power supply then due to all those reasons we cannot save the uh, mother's life so th just that I just wanted to share from my experience. 
Thank you for highlighting that. I think even when we visited the urban primary health center in Aizol, we realized that reliability of electricity adds so much value, one for basic maternal care, even though there aren't as many deliveries happening in that space, but having an oxygen concentrator available, uh, powered, having laboratory facilities where um, the, the medical officer was saying, you know, even when people come in for a fever, you have to test it and be able to give them confidence of whether it's malaria or something else. And for us to be able to provide that blood, uh, the, the blood sample report on that day requires us to run all of these testing equipment and diagnostic equipment on a daily basis. Um, so even in an urban PHC, you can see the impact, whether it's in terms of laboratory and diagnostics. And I think as Ma'am was saying, and as you pointed out, as you go further rural out, immunization, maternal care, and as Sir pointed out, critical care becomes so important when we think about reliability of electricity and its impact. Uh, we'll continue this discussion. Uh, for now, I'll hand it back. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists here. I would request the speakers to kindly uh, be on their seat. Uh, thank you so much to all the speakers for an enthusiastic discussion. We request you to kindly accept a token of our appreciation. Can we have a round of applause? region and many weavers and uh, area spinners are now using solar powered light load appliances to spun yarn from the cocoon. With that note, uh, we would like to announce that the tea is being served outside on the corridor on your left and we request you to come back by 12 p.m. to rejoin us for the next session. Thank you.